Did you hear that 91% of guys that use Dove Men Plus Care antiperspirant recommend it? Dove Men Plus Care user James said that it has some kind of clever formula in their design to look after the pits. Guess that makes Dove Men Plus Care antiperspirant the smart choice then, James. Pick some up at your local retailer today. This is the best of Mike and Mike podcast. Mike podcast. Subscribe now by going to the Listen tab in the ESPN app. The best of Mike and Mike. Good Thursday morning to you. It is Mike and Mike on ESPN Radio and ESPN2. But Greeny's out today. Will Kane in for Greeny along with the guy that holds it down, Mike Golick Sr. I have a, a few things. First, I love Nick Saban, and I can't wait to play that. Nick Saban is already in midseason form. He is just phenomenal to listen to as we actually have college football, uh, you know, coming up pretty soon as well as the NFL. Second, nervous doing the show with you because you're a lawyer and you use big words. Okay. So that always can scare me. So people learn. Like when Billis comes on, he knows if he uses big words against me, it could be in his favor because a lot of times I have to look the word up uh, and then put it in context of what he was saying. So – you know, you have that advantage uh, as I'm well. I'm nervous, too. Uh, I just don't want you to get mad at me. I'm, I'm not a physical person. There are times, and, and I've done this a lot over the 18 years, and I've certainly been guilty of it, is where I think if I yell louder, it makes me right. You know? Well, I think by, most people <laughs> subscribe to that philosophy, so I'm going to practice it throughout the day. <laughs> <laughs> just talking really loud when you want to. Yes. Because you always stay calm, and a guy like Billis always stays calm, and that makes me even more worried, you know, it, it then because I just try and talk louder, and I'm sure as people watch and listen say, oh, he's just yelling. You know, he, he's, he's trying to yell because his point isn't as good as he thinks, so he figures if he, he raises the volume on it, that it'll be a better point all of a sudden. All I'm going to do for the next four hours is measure your eyes and see how intense is he with this point. Because if I see anger, I'm out. Ripcord, I, next I, argument, let's move on to off the top. I, I will, I will, um, I won't get physical with you. <laughs> just, just know that. I, okay. I, because I went through 18 years of Greeny trying to bait me into that just so he could sue me and take my money. Because he said that's the first thing he would do. Uh, that, that he has told people, you know, either Golik will make a fool of himself being wrong and yelling or he'll hit me and I'll just take all his money. And then the third thing is I'm a little disappointed in my son, Mike Jr. Now, you've worked with him in the past uh, a few times, right? Yes. We have never done a show together. Now, Mike was supposed to be on today for an hour. Uh, so not only did he not do his show first and last, uh, Will Reeve was doing the show today. He was supposed to be on an hour of this show, but he's doing uh, the show with Rosilla today. Uh, which is cool, absolutely cool. But, I mean, he's 27 years old. Do you think he could have done an hour on this show and still done Ryan's show? I mean, where, where's the want to, right? You know, I thought I taught my kids a little, more, a little more work ethic and passion than that. You're young. You're breaking into the biz. You know, you get out there and you do different things. Get on the old man's show for an hour. Take a little nap and go on with Rosilla. But, no. All right. No, Mr. Mr. I just finished 28 hours, you know, of a fantasy football marathon needs his little CP. <laughs> Here's uh, this. So this is going to fall on deaf ears because yeah. he's sleeping right now. But I want to <laughs> tell you something. I want to tell you something, Junior, as you're listening. Hopefully your mom can wake you up, shake the bed very gently, shake right. the bed very gently to wake you up. Well, you think he still lives at home? <laughs> <laughs> Actually, that is what I but picture no, in my mind. That is. He's got, he's got his own place now. Uh, the conversation that you yeah. and I had, that your dad and I had, Junior, right before we went on the air, was how do you draw the line between coaching and parenting? In other words, you want to teach your kid all these life lessons that you impart through sports, but right. one day you wake up and your wife's like, you know what? You're his dad, yeah. not his coach. And yeah. what I just realized after mm -hmm. all the lessons you taught me before the cameras went on is mm -hmm. you're still coaching Junior I am. right now I can't separate through the it. prism of his job. I am. I can't separate it. Coach, dad, what am I here? But all I know is he bailed on the show for an hour because he had to work a little later, and I figured I would take the time to rip him. So that, that's, uh, that, that's my opening statement. <laughs> okay, all right. I, I, I would do it that way. Well, something else that we're going to get into today, we haven't done it yet. We figure we'll start today. We have uh, NFL games tonight, three of them. Baltimore at Miami, Buffalo, Philadelphia, and Tampa Bay uh, at Jacksonville. We're going to do a little grill Golic. I know you haven't, we haven't we're done the show together, but we're going to grill Golic. We're going to tell people to uh, ask anything they want. If you want to be football-related, great, sports-related, fine. 
outside of sports, that's fine. You can ask whatever you want, but a lot of people usually like to ask the, the football questions, Al. But anything you would like to do, so hashtag it, at Mike and Mike is our, our Twitter feed. Hashtag Grill Golick. You can, you can do it to mine as well, at ESPN Golick. You can do it at Will Kane uh, as well. Uh, throw questions there. So we'll get questions everywhere. Just hashtag everything. Grill Golick could be about football, just sports in general, or outside of sports. We can go down that road as well. I'm pretty hot in the, uh, you know, entertainment world as well. You're big over there? Oh, are you kidding me? Yeah. I read all those rag magazines all the time. You kidding me? You see Brad Pitt, Angelina Jolie holding off on the divorce now, maybe trying to make it work? I mean, seriously, we got some good stuff going on out there. All right, the show is presented by Progressive Insurance, and all guests are on the Shell Pinzo performance line. Again, that's hashtag at Grill Golick. Any questions you want, I have one already, which I'm going to get to in a moment okay. with you to get this thing started. But first, let's get to Off the Top. Off the Top. Well done. The top. Off the top, Aaron Judge struck out for the 33rd consecutive game on Wednesday, setting the record for the longest streak within a single season by a non-pitcher, according to the Elias Sports Bureau. He's also just two games shy of matching the longest streak within a season by any player, regardless of position. It wasn't all bad, however, as he did launch one 469-foot homer for the win. Yeah, it's a shame that's the ending line and not the beginning line. The beginning line for him has been the strikeouts. I mean, as you mentioned, 33 three games straight. So Adam Dunn, who he was tied with, is breathing a sigh of relief uh, because he doesn't now have the most as a position player. And that's the tough part for Judge now. He's he's coming up on pitchers because you would figure pitchers would be in the conversation at the top. And, again, back in 1971, Vita Blue, 34 games. Bill Stoneman, 35. Aaron Judge is right there. So if he starts catching pitchers, that's going to be bad. He did hit that bomb, though, uh, and he has 37 home runs now. We we keep talking about wanting that race with Stanton, who, as we'll get to, you know, at, at some point uh, did not hit a home run last night but still knocking the ball out of the yard. He did hit a big one. As a matter of fact, the longest home runs at City Field this year – have all come, the top five have come from the opponent, and not from anybody uh, on the Mets. So mm. that's a bummer for them. But, yeah, yeah, he had an absolute bomb last night, but continues the strikeout streak. Yeah, tale of two seasons for Aaron Judge. I mean, Do you think the home run, everybody talks about the home run derby and swinging the bat. Stanton, by the way, was in the home run derby as well. Now he lost in the first round, and he's knocking the, the, the cover off the ball all over the place out of the park. Do you think that has anything to do with it? What? The home run derby. They say oh, you, he, like if, he like he he shot his like arm. You, like you ruin your swing doing the home run derby. Yeah, yeah. I, I've had too many no, baseball people tell me that's that's ridiculous yeah. and no. I th- I think the pitchers are figuring him I out. I think that's exactly right. He is a rookie. He's a young player, and I think I, I agree. I think pitchers are figuring. What him have out. I heard? Low and away. That's what they figured out. Low and away is stands hole. I don't know. Maybe not. I just kind of threw that out there. Yeah, that's okay. Nothing wrong with that. Off the top. will correct you at some point. <laughs> Get on me, Hembo, would you? Yeah. <laughs> Floyd Mayweather and Conor McGregor to fight with eight-ounce gloves on August 26th. The Nevada Athletic State Commission voted unanimously in favor of a one-time exception to allow Mayweather and McGregor to fight with the smaller gloves for their 154-pound bout. Per the NSAC's rules, their own regulations, any boxing match contested over 147 pounds, Golic mandates 10-ounce gloves. Now, Mayweather has fought most of his career below that, so he's used 8-ounce gloves most of his career. And as we talked about with McGregor in MMA, it's 4-ounce gloves uh, that they use. So they didn't want the 10-ounce gloves. Uh, it's, I'm sure a lot of people are saying, 2 ounces, come on. You're swinging around 2 ounces a little more, can tire you out. Plus, you, know, you, want, you want your hit to be felt. And, you know, the, the smaller the glove, you can feel it a little more as, as well. Plus, Mayweather's used to it. I mean, he's used to eight-ounce gloves. So I, you could see this one coming, and they had to sign waivers. So once you sign a waiver, I'm sure the commission will say, yeah, go ahead, do what you want. I think <laughs> Just sign the waiver. We're talking about this because we all think it's something that could slightly, possibly, marginally tilt towards Conor McGregor? Right, right. Isn't that why this is an oh, issue? sure it is. Everything with this thing is an issue, and everything they do and talk about is to clicks. Get yeah. the clicks, get the pay-per-views, right. and that's it. Yeah, which is also false. This will not tilt the no. belt. But. Off the top. Off the top. Week two of the NFL preseason, as you just mentioned a few moments earlier, Golick uh, gets underway Thursday night, including the Jaguars and Buccaneers meeting at 8 Eastern on ESPN. Both teams are trying to reach the playoffs this season for the first time since 07. Only the Bills in 1999, the Browns in 02, and the Rams in 04 have longer active NFL playoff droughts. Yeah, I, I think if you look at the two teams, I don't think there's any doubt that you would think it would be Tampa Bay that could reach the playoffs first. Now, Tampa Bay is in a division with a lot of people think Carolina will be back to being better again this year. 
and they were two years ago were in the Super Bowl. Last year, Atlanta was in the Super Bowl, and obviously is, has a, a ton of offensive firepower. But Jameis Winston, another year, you know, getting a little older in the league. Obviously, you love Evans. They get to Sean Jackson. I've been watching the, the hard knocks. I absolutely love it. You know, uh, so let, let's see if this team can take the next step where Jacksonville, I think on their, uh, they're on their last <clears throat> legs of Blake Bortles. Uh, I don't think, think after this year, even if he finishes this year, is going to be the quarterback of the future for that team. They've been spending money in free agency, especially on defense. They've been trying to build that team, but unfortunately not to a lot of success. And I think it's either Tennessee or Houston that's going to be the class of that division this year. Speaking of Blake Bortles, you see what his teammates are doing. Yeah, yeah. Oh, Instagram? Yeah, it's, it's, uh. been, it's been tough for Blake. It doesn't seem to be a real cohesive thing going on down there right now. Jalen Ramsey liked an article on Instagram that talked about how to replace Blake Bortles. Yeah, best options to replace Blake Bortles. Yeah, it, it's yeah, not 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 great, not great. What's going on down there? A lot of frustration. Off the top, the top. And as you mentioned, Giancarlo Stan's home run streak snapped at six games, and now he sets the goal at sixty-one. Stanton didn't homer against the Giants Wednesday, but he said he's shooting for 61 and said he finds baseball statistical history both alluring but also tainted. Stanton is on pace for 61 homers. Babe Ruth hit a record 60 homers in 1927, and Stanton said he gives that achievement an asterisk because the sport wasn't integrated yet. Mantle's teammate Roger Maris broke the record with 60, 61 home runs in 1961. Barry Bond set the record with 73 and 01 during the steroids era, and Stanton said he also considers that total tainted. And this is, this is Stanton's quote. I do, meaning consider it tainted, but at the same time, it doesn't matter. The record is the record. Yeah, I know. We, we talked a lot <clears throat> about that yesterday. I know you guys, t- I believe, touched that in on first take as no, well. No, I talked about it with you, you actually. Yeah. Oh, yeah, no, yeah. with us. I didn't know if it carried over to first, uh, first take or not. No, there was some more tension <clears throat> conversations Yeah, I was going to say, you guys, you guys got after it a little bit yesterday. Uh, you know, th- this is... This has obviously been a, been a big topic. Greeny threw out a poll yesterday of, of would you, the public, consider it the record if he, got to, if he broke 61? Did he break the real record? And 56% said no, the record is 73. And at the end of the day, it is. It's just a matter of what we think <clears throat> because we're, it's all about public opinion. As we get into the NFL and the NFLPA, that's you know, one of the things they're battling for is public opinion. So that, that's what we like to look at a lot is public opinion of what do you think in this situation the record is 73 it's not going to change but should it be noted differently in the record books than other things no no that that there that is off Off the top top, the top all right what everyone's talking about is brought to you by o'reilly auto parts better parts better prices every day let's just do that what you just mentioned you know i struggle with this goal on one hand i feel like if i ask you a question i don't need a paragraph in return for the answer especially on something as simple as hey What's the home run record in baseball? I don't need you to go through, well, you know, Babe Ruth, 60, but, eh, asterisk. Uh, well, you know, Barry Bonds, 73, but you know what, asterisk. I don't want to have to listen to a 30-second exposition before you get to the answer of what the home run record is. That is how I feel on one hand. It should be black and white. It should be in the record books. It's something that most of us should be able to agree upon. On the other hand, that debate, well, that is sports. That bar right. debate is what we love about sports. I just feel like we need a starting point. Let's start with Bonds and then move on from there. Yeah, I, I think and, – and before before we continue, Stanton actually addressed this yesterday, so let's let's hear it from, from his own mouth of his thoughts about, you know, 61 being the record and just his thought, is 62 a record in his mind or, or is it 73? I mean, you grow up watching Sandlot. You grow up watching all the old – films of Babe Ruth and Mandel and these guys and uh, 61's always been kind of that printed number um, as a kid. Do you consider that the home run number? Considering some things I do um, but uh, at the same time it doesn't matter the record's the record Um, but uh, personally I think I do yeah. So I mean that that that's where we are. To to right. to your point of the question, he gave a little more of a paragraph answer. Not only bonds, but integration as well uh, in baseballs uh, when Babe Ruth was playing. And, and this has been my thought, and I brought this up a few times. Will and and people and, and again, uh, people think I back steroids and say use them whenever you want. I did use steroids uh, when I came off my shoulder. Uh, if, if for those that may not know. Uh, I had a total uh, shoulder reconstruction in 88, and in that offseason, right after it, 
I, I did steroids for a six, eight week cycle because I knew I had to get back on the field by minicamp or I wasn't going to have a job. And, and I was back in time for minicamp. And the, the question is there, do you think I, I, I would have been back anyway? And the answer is I don't know. But I felt I needed to do that. It wasn't on the books then. There was no testing then in the NFL. So it wasn't – it was illegally written that you can't do it, but it wasn't tested for. So – I did it. I knew I wasn't going to get tested for once the testing started. That was the only time I ever did it. I never did it again, but I did do it. So as that is the backdrop, so anytime I talk about steroids, people think I'm jaded for it, that everybody should be able to use it, especially when I said the steroid users, I think, should be in the Hall of Fame. It is part of the history of the game. Quick question. With everybody asking you that, I'm curious, do you have any regrets about using it? Oh, sure. I mean, yeah, you, 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 you don't want to. There are times when you don't want to artificially, I sit there and say that, artifi- I, and I guess this is the point I'm getting to. There are lines of being artificial because I took every pain injection and pain pill I could to play on Sundays. So where's the line? You know, I was, I was artificially masking any injury I had so I could play. I would stick a needle anywhere and I would take any pill so I could play on Sunday. And I was always asked, well, aren't you concerned about your body at 40 or 50? I said, I'm concerned about playing on Sunday. That was my mentality. And I'm not saying it's the greatest mentality in the world, but all it had to be is for me to justify it, right? That was the only reason. So in talking about the steroids and and when when the conversation gets crazy about PEDs, my thought is, and even with Stanton. So what did Stanton bring up? He brought up integration. He brought up the, the PEDs. And you know what I keep bringing up, and you know what is forgotten? The last I checked, and you can't tell me it didn't affect record books, amphetamines. Did amphetamines affect record books? I'm sure it did. You know, and and the argument I get is, well, it doesn't do as much as steroids. Let me ask you a question. Are amphetamines illegal? Are steroids illegal? You take them to help, help, right? You're not taking an amphetamine to say, you know what? This does nothing for me, but let me take it anyway. You're taking it for a reason just like you're taking PEDs for a reason. So that all went on forever. I mean, it was like in, in uh, the NFL when, you know, pain pills would be in a candy dish, you know. But amphetamines, amphetamines were illegal. And, and they were taken all the time. And it was just a wink and a nod, and you knew it. So to, to, and, and you can't tell me that didn't, maybe not enhancing the way PEDs enhanced the home run number, but does it still mean it didn't enhance anything at all? Did it do anything? People say, oh, it just, it just helped them play the next game. It gave them the energy. Well, okay. So they were artificial, artificially pepped up to play another game, which could get them a hit, which could do something for them, or a home run that could do something. Were balls doctored? Do pitchers doctor baseballs? Is that legal, illegal? Uh, clearly did it help they did, their, yes. Did it help their stats? Did, did, did it, do those pitchers still have those stats in the record books? My point is there are things throughout baseball that have affected the record books. Now, no doubt there's a degree to them. So that's my question. Where's your line? Okay, we don't accept the PEDs. Amphetamines is fine. Fine. We accept that of, of what, how that helped somebody artificially create a number that's in a record book somewhere. It's always at the top of the record book. Could be a guy that's in third, in third place in some statistics somewhere that the amphetamine helped them. But you know what you can't do? is you can't point to it specifically and say, well, that helped them get that record in that record book. Where with PEDs, you can point to that and say, look at the home run guys right now. All of them have some either tested positive for it or have something hanging around them about steroids. So you can point directly to it, which makes it the easiest target. So let me that ask. That makes sense at all. Absolutely. So, but let me ask your question back to you. Then. Okay. Where is your line? My line is, my line is. When I say this, you're going to think I say do whatever you want. My line is accept them all as this went on. So This, this went on. So Bonds is 73, to your argument in mind, is no more tainted than any record set in the 70s when greenies were passed out in the locker room. That, that's, that's where it does get dicey because you can, you can point to that. So is it more than the amphetamines? But does that make it okay? Does that make it only okay to only point at bonds or the PED users and not point at the guys that use amphetamines? That's why my point is we are so adamant about keeping these guys out and making sure if they go in, there's something written in there that says this was the steroid era and this is why these guys got the numbers that they did when amphetamines, it's hard to point to specifically to say how it helped, but you damn well can't tell me it didn't. 
You can't. They're not taking them to not help, artificially help you. And amphetamines were illegal, like steroids were illegal unless they're prescribed for you. So I guess that's my point. There's something that went on along the line in the game of baseball in any sport that went on that, in my mind, you can't just specifically point to one thing and said, that's ruining baseball. Let's keep those guys out of the out of the Hall of Fame. And our line says, we'll let those guys in the Hall of Fame. So, you know, you know you're, you're getting louder. I know. And so okay. I'm measuring your eye contact. OK, I'm on my heels. There is no rebuttal <laughs> coming. I want you to know you have successfully through the tone of your voice set the standard of, of where this debate is going. No, I'm joking. You, um, I, I get and I get no, ripped for that. No, I, you know. I, I hear your passion. And the truth of the matter is um, you are touching on a very sensitive debate that goes well beyond the baseball diamond. You know, we will have debates t- from time to time on, for, on, on, on ESPN. We'll have it in general society. Um, the, the, should the NFL begin to accept marijuana as a, as a, as a pain-relieving right. drug? Right. Should we legalize marijuana in states like Colorado, Washington? Should mm-hmm. we legalize it broader? And a, a constant rebuttal, and not one without merit is, but if this is okay, why not the next thing? Right. Right. How do you draw lines? Drawing lines is one of the hardest things that we can do in Agreed. these debates. If I accept marijuana, do I have to accept heroin? If I accept greenies, do I have to accept steroids? Right. And by the way, we're not limited to talking about steroids. Now we have the all-encompassing word of PEDs because right. what we're really talking about – when it comes to McGuire, we know this was the case, HGH, right. some of these other drugs. Right. All I would say to you is this, and I don't have an answer. I think you've set a very, very good argument down. My answer, to the surprise of many, is I don't know. But I do think about this. Sometimes I don't compare the guy who took Greenies against the guy who took HGH. I compare the guy who didn't. And there are those players yeah, who they didn't get lost take anything, yeah. and they're the ones that got cheated. Yeah, they do get lost in it. I- I'm with you there. The best of Mike and Mike. All right. Joining us now in studio, the very dapper, as always, NFL insider, Field Yates. Thank you, Will. You have sort of a greedy look going on this morning with that button-down mid, mid-roll-up. Yeah. Yeah. Well, actually, that's, good. that's a that perfect tee-up, man. Let me th- this is something we're doing this morning. Grill Golic. Uh, you're allowed to ask Mike Golic anything you anything. want about football, anything. life, as Favorite kid. Said. Be yeah. honest. <laughs> What's that? Favorite kid. Favorite kid? Yeah, because you know, I feel like the world knows your children, not just Mike Jr. Right, but Jake and Sydney as well. Jake yeah, and Sydney yeah. as well. Uh, first, Jake played, Sydney <laughs> swam, and they also are all you know active and popular on social media. Yes. Favorite kid? Yes, uh, that changes daily. Like today, Mike is third. Mike was supposed to be on this show for an hour today. He's doing a show with Rosilla later and didn't feel he should do both. That At is, 27 years old, what kind of, like, they have all the energy in the world. Where's the work ethic? So he's third. I got this. Okay, hold on. How old is your youngest? Sydney is 22. In over the last 22 years, who has the most time ranked at number one? There we go. Another way of phrasing it. Wow. Wow. I'd have to think about I'd have to break that down. <laughs> you, are, you are dancing. There's <laughs> no Maybe doubt. your new daughter-in-law. There's no doubt Sydney has spent the most money, without question, <laughs> with, by, by far. But Mike and Jake added up together. Mike, Jake, and me added up together. Sydney has spent more money than the three of us, no doubt about it. So that that's gonna that, by the way, is a negative. Okay? That, I that's what that was. That's saying. a negative. <laughs> now you have two kids. Are they? They're both boys. Yeah, they're both boys. Okay, there you yeah. go. Yeah. yeah, yeah. You'll have some money then. <laughs> All right, that uh, you can ask. You folks listening at home can ask Mike Golick whatever you want today. Hashtag Grill Golick mm-hmm. on Twitter. Uh, really quickly, I have one because of your point just now. I'm rocking a little bit of a greeny look. Yes. But Golik, you've been sitting in this seat for quite some time, yep. navigating that difficult line in corporate America of business casual, right? which is one of the most difficult lines to navigate. Many companies have done away with business, business casual because to some people it means flip-flops and other, others it means khakis. Mm-hmm. Two buttons down? One button down? Am I going too low? It's well, the eternal debate that it, has it is. no answer. I think a lot of it is is what do you got going on underneath. <clears throat> you're, you got a lot of hair going on underneath there. So it's just a matter if you're comfortable showing Wait, that. Is that a negative or is that a positive? Uh, no, no. <laughs> I, I think it could be a positive because you got the beard as well. So I, I think it could work. This is more a fashion question. This is normally where Greeny would jump in. Right. I was questions say. like that. I, what do you think? Two buttons down. No doubt about really? it. Really? Yeah, of course. Bold. Listen, it's like you're on the beach. It's that, that mentality. Now, listen, I don't have any chest hair. Shockingly, I'm sure to America, shockingly, I don't have a ton of chest hair. So I always go two buttons down. Shockingly. All right. <laughs> Not shockingly, apparently, to Mike Golick. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> we do want to get into some football. Not just Grill Golick today. 
But uh, the the big topic of the day field seems to be the fight brewing between the NFL and the NFLPA over Zeke Elliott's suspension. Our own Jim Trotter had this to say on the back and forth between the two organizations earlier. If domestic violence weren't so serious, this whole thing would be laughable. I mean, think about it. You've got the NFL, the masters of getting ahead of the story. Let's not forget Spygate, Bountygate, Deflategate, now publicly accusing someone else of leaking information in a personal conduct case. I mean, it's just hard to wrap your head around that. But what's happening is the league wants to control the narrative as long as it can before Ezekiel Elliott's hearing at the end of the month. And remember, the league has been criticized for the way it has handled domestic violence cases in the past. Just think back to last year. Josh Brown got a one-game suspension, even though he was arrested on domestic violence charges, even though his then-wife alleged that the league moved her and their children to a different hotel during the Pro Bowl. And now the league seems to have gone to the extreme other end of the spectrum with Elliott here. So clearly the league is sensitive to public perception here and is trying to win in the court of public opinion before the hearing comes down. I know, I know, Will, you guys were talking about this a bunch, I believe, on first take yesterday, and I know you, you, you dove pretty deep into this one. You know, I spoke to someone from the NFL last night, and I'm really sympathetic to the position that they are in. They feel like hmm. they that's cannot win. They cannot win. That's What's what winning they feel mean? like. What does winning mean? Well, that's the point, Field. And ultimately, while I am sympathetic to their position, I'm not sympathetic to the position they have put themselves in. That's correct. And that's this. You can't win because you're trying to. You can't win in the court of public opinion because the public cannot determine your policies. It will always change. It will always change with the tides. You have to have a position that you consistently stick with. And this one right here in the position they've taken over the last two days specifically when it comes to Zeke Kelly's suspension, I cannot wrap my mind around. Well, it's hard for them to win in the court of public opinion because trust has been fractured between not just the NFLPA and the NFL, but the public in the NFL, whether you – have a Tom Brady jersey affixed to your wall in your bedroom, or whether you think Tom Brady is the worst person on earth, nobody thought that the way that the NFL handled Deflategate was reasonable and timely and a good look for that side. It was ridiculous. The Greg Hardy case, the Ray Rice case, these things have all been bungled by the NFL. They fumbled these cases seemingly left and right. In the court of public opinion, the NFL probably won't win. With Zeke Elliott, the issue probably stemming uh, in some people's mind, and I think it's important to note this. There's a conversation about the Zeke Elliott case. The case and the matters involving the case that that are taking place now are separate from what uh, Zeke Elliott was charged with initially, right? And I'm not saying that we are overlooking the importance of domestic violence, but we, we are now looking at a case that involves the politics of the NFL versus the NFLPA. So that's going to be part of the story now. It already has become part of the story that these two sides are bickering publicly. Um, but the NFL, that statement yesterday was, as, J- as Jim said, it was explosive. I mean, for them to accuse the NFLPA of leaking information, you better expect a, a harsh response from the NFLPA, which is what they got. And all of a sudden, I'm not saying the story has moved off of what is at the heart of it, which is the NFL and, and, and taking a serious stance on domestic violence and helping to uh, – you know, try to help put an end to domestic violence incidents. But now all of a sudden, a big part of the story in people's mind is the NFL and the NFLPA sounding like an old married couple fighting with each other and just spewing back and forth. Yeah, the NFL is probably going to look worse in the end uh, because I think the the public, those the fans, have a, a lack of trust with this with this league after what's taking place over the past few years. Here are those statements you're referencing, Field. This is from the NFL yesterday. Over the past few days, we've received multiple reports from the NFLPA spreading derogatory information to the media about the victim in the Ezekiel Elliott discipline case. These tactics are shameful. Efforts to shame and blame victims are often what prevent people from coming forward to report violence and or seek help in the first place. That from the NFL's Joe Lockhart. Then from the NFLPA. They said, you read better than I do. So you read <laughs> the public statement issued on behalf of the, every NFL owner is a lie. The NFLPA categorically denies the accusations made in this statement. We know the league office has a history of being exposed for its lack of credibility. They should be ashamed of stooping to new, old, new lows. Field, to go to your point of when does it go off topic, it, it happened in Deflake. Almost, I, I think, two-thirds of that thing or more, we never mentioned what actually happened on the field. Nothing it was, was deflated. At, at some point, it got to a course that both sides had to stay. 
the NFL was fighting for, you know, whatever whatever part that was in the CBA, 46 or whatever it was, to, to keep the power. And it would became a battle of court, not a battle of was there deflated footballs on the field anymore. And has this gone that route? I'm, I look, guys, at a more general thing here of because this is my sport. I was in the union. I was part of a strike in 87. The, and I look at relationships in other sports. I look at the relationship in basketball of NBA and uh, the NBA uh, Players Association, Michelle Roberts running that and Adam Silver, and how they are working together. I mean, it is, it, it, it's textbook right now. Right. And I look at my sport and the vitriol that's going on between both sides – and, and, and it makes me nuts because it's not going to get any better. I don't know if it's going to get better until there's new leadership on one side, the other side, or both sides. I have no idea because there's just headbanging that's going on. In my opinion, they're worried too much about public opinion. Right. But, again, it's a sport or it's a business that relies on the public buying tickets. It relies on the public buying memorabilia. And maybe more importantly, it relies on the advertisers giving the big money. So is it public opinion or advertisers' opinion that they're trying to sway to their side? I'm ty- I, I wish they would stop talking because that's exactly what's going on. Right. This is about public opinion, and you lose sight of what's actually actually happening in the case itself. Also yesterday, uh, Roger Goodell appointed Harold Henderson to be the arbiter in Ezekiel Elliott's appeal. He's the same guy who previously had this role for both Greg Hardy and Adrian Peterson's hearings. We know in Greg Hardy's case, his, Harold Henderson reduced his suspension from 10 games to four. Uh, Golick mentioned this earlier, Field. He said, this relationship between the NFL and the NFLPA is not going to be fixed without a change in leadership. Here's my question for both of you. I'll start with you, Field. Do you see any potential for a change in leadership on either side? I mean, it's really hard to imagine Commissioner Goodell's tenure coming to a close anytime soon. Of course, he has a contract, and you can say what you want about him. And again, we, we keep using this word perception. It's, it's sort of the, the heart of this issue. Yeah, I, I think if you polled 1,000 NFL fans, yeah, maybe – more than half of them don't love Roger Goodell, but it doesn't matter. But if now two 32, of the league's most important owners as well. But if 30, well, first of all, I think that the relationship has certainly smoothed over, smoothed over between Robert Kraft yep. and, and Roger Goodell. And in time, I imagine that Jerry Jones will have the same, uh, well, I, And the majority I say, of owners, I, would think, I, think, I think, are, yeah. are backing, are, are fine with And the bottom Roger's line doing. is if he has 32 ownership groups happy, Roger Goodell's job probably is not. If, if, the, if the bottom line of the NFL dollars and cents, continues to rise. His job, I'm not saying, is you know secure infinitely, but you know something? He's got a pretty good chance of sticking around for quite some time. While public perception of the league and the mistakes they've made so the public is, is against them in a lot of things, I boil it down to this, and I would never ask for anybody's job, and I don't know, I, you know, DeMorris got voted back in again, so I don't think he's going anywhere anytime soon. These two are going to have to work together, or their groups are going to have to work together. But as far as to your question, what side is losing? What side is feeling on the outside looking in? What side feels like they don't have a say in any of this? And the, the union. answer is the union, union. right? Right. Yeah. So if 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 players get tired of that enough, do they get tired with leadership from that and say we need we need a change in this? And, and I don't think it's going to happen. I'm not calling for that. Don't think it's going to happen. But isn't that how you look at a situation? Which side usually is getting the short end of the stick? And there's a lot that goes to that because owners have deeper pockets. It's tough for players to hold uh, to hold out in a strike situation because they're going to lose the, the money. They're going to lose, and the owners lose are two different numbers. So it's difficult for them. They're in a tough position no doubt about it well greeny we're halfway through another baseball season and we're really seeing some players who stand out as winners kind of like business travelers who win at business by staying at la quinta inns and suites that's because you can put your la quinta returns loyalty points to work on the spot with instant free nights just drive up with no reservation and instantly redeem points for a free night that same night simply by using the la quinta app it's like hitting a grand slam with an app instead of a bat well played prepare to win at business by learning more about instant free nights and check out the summer rates at lq.com you're listening to Love Advice with Leanne. Caller, you're on the air. Uh, hi, Leanne. Long-time listener, first-time caller. <laughs> Why, in your professional opinion, do you never take my calls off the air? Is this Carl? Yep, it's Carl. I mean, we had a few dates. Everything was great, I thought. Uh... Well, you know, when you switch to GEICO, you could save a lot of money on car insurance. Okay, awesome. You should call them. I will. GEICO, because saving 15% or more on car insurance is always a great answer.
It's Mike and Mike on ESPN Radio and ESPN2. Will Kane sitting in for Greeny today along with Mike Golick. Um, you can tweet us on the 100flowers.com Twitter feed. I'm at Will Kane, W-I-L-L-C-A-I-N. Well, I at ESPN you. Golick. I follow you, but then once you follow somebody, you just forget. At ESPN Golick. At ESPN Golick. Yeah. And, by the way, if you want to ask Golick questions today, mm-hmm. we're doing a Grill Golick. Yes, we so are. on Twitter, hashtag Grill Golick. Send in your questions for Mike. On in the NFL, on life questions, on raising children, <laughs> whatever it may be. Yeah, we're at different stages. I'm 27, 26, 22. You're 9 and 6. Yeah. Wow. I've already asked for advice before the show started. <sighs> yes, you did. You are right in it, man. You are right in that Little League sports stuff going that's on. That's where you went right away, and that's where my questions yeah. were right away. Yeah. You, know? you are right there, man. Lighten up. That's the, that's what the wife said. Well, listen, you're his dad, I, not his I, coach. I will I will always say to my uh, God rest my his soul, my father. He coached us in little league, and I coached my kids in little league. And when I first, Mike was the oldest, so he was the first one I was going to coach in little league. It was T ball, and he said, "You will love coaching your kids." He said, "The parents are the but." He said, "Understand, it can get ruined by parents," and he was right. They're they're the crazy ones out there. It's a, but it's a great experience and one you should definitely enjoy. And now that I've done it and gone back, I could do it more calmly because I can't sit there and say I was perfect at it either. Oh, <laughs> really? That's no, oh. Yeah, tough time. To, the, the delineation between father and coach, you know, and where that line is. Yeah. Yeah. Honestly, you know, you talk about how terrible parents can be towards the coach, but I, the thing is, what you do is you get invested in your child's success. Yeah. Not just you. You tell yourself, not just because of his athletic career, right. but because we teach life lessons through the prism of sports. Mm-hmm. So you come home going, well, did you, did you, did you give 100% there? Were oh, you, yeah. Are you really committed? About what are we doing effort, here? effort, about team play, helping your teammate, no quit, and all, all that fun stuff rolled into then, you know, getting the email from a parent, why isn't my kid playing more? And I would have a meeting before every team I coach with the players and the parents and say, we're going to learn the fundamentals of this sport. You're going to have fun because they're kids. You're going to have fun, and we're going to try and win along the way. But, you know, that's not number one. I said, so I I just wanted to tell the parents up front, if that's your motivation here for your kid to play one position all the time and to win all the time, I said, that's probably not going to happen here because I'd moved kids around to different spots and, you know, just tried to let them in. And I I know it's different. That's the one big thing. Your era of raising kids in the Little League is way different than even when Mike and Jake and Sydney were doing that from the, the, the concept of playing multiple sports as opposed to just playing one. And a lot of it is a coach telling a kid you won't be on this team unless you're playing it year-round. I always love throwing out the stat of the, uh, the, the players that got drafted in the NFL. 85% were multi-sport athletes in high school. And I've always thought that's, that is the way to go. But it's way easier said than done, as I talked about, right. of, of between parents and, and coaches on, on the, the, you know, the, the road for your, your if athlete. You, if you don't commit, if you don't commit to a sport specifically hard, yeah. and go year-round, you get left behind. Yeah, it can be tough. I read once, by the way, on a survey, and don't, don't quote me on this because I'm not going to be able to source this, but when asked, most children have said their least favorite aspect of youth sports was the ride home with dad afterwards. Can be. Yeah, yeah. That's a, that's a tough one for us dads to take, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. We, a, shut up. Because at times we can't turn it off. <laughs> right. Exactly right. So, um, friend of the show, what what do we say here with Joe Thomas, one of the best offensive linemen in the Joe Thomas, the, the guy right walks into the Hall of Fame, you know, five years when he's done, one of the great, great offensive linemen to play this game and a really, really good guy. Really good guy. Offensive lineman for the Cleveland Browns. He spoke about the quarterback competition going on in Cleveland. Listen. I would expect Brock to win because of his experience. Um, And a rookie quarterback is the hardest position to get ready to play in your first year. And uh, so there's no doubt he could win the competition. I definitely would expect probably Brock to win it as a quarterback. It takes at least two or three years to have a basic level of understanding of NFL defenses and offenses to be able to operate proficiently out there on the field, especially in week one. I think that they're grooming Brock to be the starter in week one um, based on what I've seen. And again, when he's saying he can can beat him out, but he thinks Osweiler was sorry, he's talking about Deshaun Kaiser, uh, the quarterback from Notre Dame who Another one of the rookie quarterbacks in his first preseason game. Slow start for him. Better second half. Throws a great deep ball um, and, and did it a couple of times 
in that game. So that, that's the talk of, boy, these rookie quarterbacks, this particular group, maybe outside of Deshaun Watson because of experience, they need to sit and not play. And, just, and all of them looked good in their first preseason game, which obviously brings up questions. Do you think Dak Prescott's success has completely warped our expectations of the success that a rookie quarterback well, can have? I, I think that and just today's game that says, what have you, I need it now. I need, I need you to perform for me right now. And you can and it, it before the rookie wage scale, the last quarterback taken number one before the rookie wage scale was Sam Bradford, and you're paying a guy fifty million dollars. So I think sometimes there was like, man, we're paying this guy all this money, get him on the field, you know. Where now you feel you can take a break a little more because the money investment is basically almost cut in half from guaranteed money to what it was to what it is now. So I think you feel you can take your time a little more. But there's still, if I take that guy in the first round, there's expectations. It's just a matter of when you start the clock. And a lot goes into it. A lot goes into it from the team you're on to how well that team is doing that year to how well the bridge, quote-unquote, bridge quarterback is playing. So by the end of this year, how many teams do you think will have made the turn to committing to those? I mean, we've got the Texans, right. the Browns, um, We've got the Bears. Not going to happen in the Chiefs. I don't think Mahomes is going gonna, is gonna to be displacing Alex Smith this year. Uh, we know Mahomes is going to be the guy going forward, and they'll start that transition, something that Alex Smith, unfortunately, is used to with Kaepernick out uh, in San Francisco. Uh, Will, that, that, that's where, again, I say there are other factors involved. Houston, nobody expects Cleveland and or Chicago to be, to be competing for a division. They do, they, and, and, and they should. You go, should go into every week thinking you're going to win the game. But for, for us in the discussion we're having, we don't feel those two teams are going to be involved in, in the hunt. Houston Texans, top-ranked defense, nice weapons on offense, quarterback situation going on. What is their motive? Deshaun Watson may win that job outright much like the quarterback that got the money in um, Matt Flynn in Seattle all of a sudden is beaten out by a third-rounder in Russell Wilson, you know, his, his rookie year. So that may happen there, or if because of the pressure that Houston is supposed to be good, if they're not and Savage is struggling, they'll yank him. They'll yank him and put Deshaun Watson in because there are expectations this year of, okay, Savage is the veteran, certainly not a veteran who's got – you know, great stats behind him, but we're going to trust him early on if he is a starter in week one because this team has expectations. Cleveland and Chicago, they're building for the future with these quarterbacks. So now it's a matter of when do you give them the shot? What do you do? Because you have 52 other guys in the locker room who a lot think as soon as you go to a rookie that you're kind of bailing a little bit on the season, saying, okay, we've started that process right now. Now we're going to go through some growing pains because I don't care how good you were coming in or how good you look in preseason, rookie quarterbacks are going to struggle. They can look good. Dak looked very good. Dak was the exception more than the rule on how you look. And can you put in there the old line he played with? He had a rookie running back who was obviously great as well. The defense wasn't great there, but he had a good surrounding cast. But still, he he was an exception more than a rule. You remember? Let's go. Let's go back. Peyton Manning threw twenty eight interceptions his rookie year. Troy Aikman wasn't great shakes coming out as a rookie. You can go down the line. It's a it's a fifty fifty proposition with those top guys. I believe over the course of his career, Joe Thomas has blocked for something like 20 different starters for the Cleveland Browns. Yeah. That's since 2007. It's crazy. And they, they did get some help for them on the interior line this year, which is good because they needed that. So maybe the quarterback won't be running for his life as much in Cleveland. Either Osweiler or Kaiser will be 21, and I imagine we're going to see 22 before the end of this season. Yeah, I would you agree. bring up an interesting point about how the other guys in the locker room feel once you move to a rookie quarterback. And I think I know the answer to this question, but have you ever been on a team that you feel like was not doing everything it could to win the game you're going into? No, I mean, when I was in Houston, uh, Warren Moon was our quarterback. When I was in Philadelphia, it was Randall Cunningham. Then he got hurt, and, and then we went through the tons of you know of quarterbacks, like four or five quarterbacks, including a Jim McMahon who, who had got injured as well. But Jim McMahon, and then in Miami one year, it was Dan Marino. So we were – it was never a position like people – I know where you're going. People talking about, like, the Jets this year. That's exactly where I'm going. You know? Can we count on – and I think this applies to the Browns as well – a quarterbacking decision to be made with the purpose of playing 
the best quarterback, with the purpose being, let's try to win the game? Or will Hackenberg be the guy, not because he's the best, but because what, either we need to find out what he is, or we're not interested in winning because we're in the Sam Darnold sweepstakes? Yeah, see, the, the, the tanking in football gets, gets a little dicey to me because I think what happened with the Jets is they tried to load up, and they have old guys, and then they just said, okay, we're not, we're not going where we thought we were going to go. We've got, we had some older guys. We need to shed that and kind of start over again. So I think if you see, I think they have to get Hackenberg in there at some point. See what you have. You have a second-round kid who they basically wouldn't put in a game last year, which tells you what they were seeing in practice, okay? Because once the preseason games are over, and all you, all you have is practice then. And they wouldn't put him in the game. So that, that, to me, speaks volumes to not even get him some time in the game. you got to find out. You spent a second-round draft pick on that guy. you got to find out what he can do, unless you just don't think he's ready at all to step in there and play. So if he goes in, uh, Jets another team, obviously you don't think are, is going to compete this year, while the players certainly should think they will. Um, at some point, you're going to have to go down that road. And the thing about the players that I talked about in the locker room, players also know. <laughs> Players understand, like Joe, like when Deshaun Kaiser goes in uh, for whatever reason, Joe Thomas knows this is going. Joe Thomas knows it right now that it's going to happen at some point. You know, guys in in the Bears locker room know that eventually it's going to go to Trubisky. Just when is that going to happen? And and so you kind of change your mindset when that happens. You say, okay, now the clock starts on us going forward. Now, how long will this take? A reminder that this Saturday, our next top-ranked boxing title fight is a unification battle for the first time in over a decade between undefeated 140-pound champions. Terrence Crawford put his WBO, WBC, and Ring Magazine world titles on the line against IBF and WBA champ Julius Indongo. The bout begins at 10 p.m. Eastern live on ESPN on the ESPN app. Can can there be a problem in boxing when you just mentioned five or so different places you can have a title? Yes. I mean, holy smokes. Yes. Just throw three letters out there and it's probably associated with boxing. (laughs) <laughs> um, let's keep this quarterback conversation going. I, I'm, I am fascinated by the idea of how do you know when you know when a quarterback basically is a bust, that he's no good, and does that mean you're not going to play him, which I think is a really hard thing, I would imagine, for players to get their minds around. The best of Mike and Mike. Good Thursday morning to you. It is Mike and Mike on ESPN Radio and ESPN2, but Greeny's out today. Will Kane sitting in for Greeny along with Golick. The show is presented by Progressive Insurance and all guests on the Shell Pinzo Performance Line. I haven't yelled at you a lot this morning, right? You got worked up right out of the game. Yeah, but I, I wasn't but at it wasn't you. At, right, it wasn't, wasn't at you. Exactly. That's the thing about Greeny. Even if it's not at him, he feels intimidated. <laughs> you know, and, 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 he, and he, he shakes a bit. Do I get intimidated? No, no, I don't think you do at all. Not was uh, actually incredible passion from you, incredible authenticity on the role of steroids in sports, specifically when it comes to baseball and how it affects records, your own experience with mm-hmm. it. Anyone that wants to hear that should go back and listen to the Mike and Mike podcast because it wasn't a really interesting story you told. And speaking of, by the way, your life, we are doing a thing called Grill Golic this morning. Yes, Hashtag we are. Grill Golic. Mm-hmm. You can ask questions for him, football questions, food questions, life questions, whatever it may be. And so speaking of your life, I really like this one. Hopefully you can do it in a short amount of time, not like I'll try. over into the next hour. I don't think you want to because of the nature of the question. Mm-hmm. What's your most embarrassing moment in life? That's from Marcus Moore. My most in life or in sports? It says life. Life. Man, that I, I, would, that, I would have to take a while to, uh, <laughs> to think of that one. In sports, it was actually a lot of people wonder when I played, they were waiting for me to tell like a Notre Dame story or an NFL story. It was when I was 10 years old. I was the quarterback on that little league team. I was bigger than everybody else, and, I, and we ran the option. And I was a large quarterback, and, and I faked the handoff. I was 10 years old. Faked the handoff, and it worked. Everybody kind of went to that, and then I ran around the end, and I was home free. But I was, while I was the biggest, I was one of the slowest. So as I was running, I was going more toward the sideline, getting toward the sideline. Some kid dove at me around my waist, and because I was way bigger than him, I didn't fall down, and he did. But when he fell down, he took my pants down with him. So my football pants were at my ankles. All I had on was the jock. Mm-hmm. Still upright, still running. Still running. Now, now shuffling. Now, now even shuffling. slower <laughs> until their whole team eventually caught me and drilled me out of bounds. So I'm a 10-year-old, got tackled out of bounds with my football pants at my ankles, only my jock strap on, and where did I get tackled? 
right in the middle of the cheerleaders. <laughs> so at 10 years old, that was, you know, a little bit embarrassing. Deep pants. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so that, that was that. was that. Having a little internal debate, if I talk about water polo initiation back in college, that also included deep pantsing. I, you were water polo. <laughs> man, let me tell you what, that is a tough sport. I wish it was around here. My daughter, who was a swimmer, I know you were a swimmer as well, uh, she, I think she would have been excellent at water polo because I, she, was a, she did really well in swimming, but she's a bit of a psycho. And, and I think her in the pool and water polo, I think, would have worked out really well for her and not well for the people around her. Well, I'll just leave it at this. Water polo practice was before swim team practice. Right. Water polo practice was before the girls' swim team practice. And let's call it a tradition that at the beginning of every year, freshmen were um, deep pants, similar right. to sure, your experience. Sure, sure, sure. And forced to figure out a way to make their way back to the locker room okay. while girls' swim practice was going on. All right. So, um, long story short, I married one of those swim team girls. So, oh, that a boy! Let that I just say, <laughs> get out of the pool and walk proudly back to the locker room. That's what I did, you know man. What I'm talking about it worked out. That's what I'm saying. All right, yeah, off the top now. All off right. the top, off the top. All right, Aaron Judge struck out for the 33rd consecutive game on Wednesday, setting the record for the longest streak within a single season by a non-pitcher, according to the Elias Sports Bureau. He's also just two games shy of matching the longest streak within a season by any player, yeah. regardless of position. It wasn't all bad. However, he did launch a 469-foot homer for the win. He In hit the a win. bomb, his 37th home run. But unfortunately, the headline for him is the striking out. And as you mentioned, he, he is the most by a position player, and I broke the tie with Adam Dunn. He's now chasing Vita Blue and Bill Stoneman, who both in 71 struck out in 34 and 35 games consecutively, respectively there. Since uh, the – during, I should say, the 33-game strikeout streak, he's hitting 191. He struck out 55 times, and he has seven home runs, all ranking horribly, horribly bad in Major League Baseball. So he's struggling. And, and I, I think it's to what we talked about earlier. We had Timmy Kirkshaw. You get figured out a bit, you know, especially at that size as well uh, when everything's lengthened a bit. He has just gotten figured out some, and we'll see if it starts to revert back the other way. Let's see if he can figure it out. Right. Off the top. The top. Floyd Mayweather and Conor McGregor are set to fight with eight-ounce gloves on August 26th. The Nevada State Athletic Commission voted unanimously in favor of a one-time exception to allow Mayweather and McGregor to fight with the smaller gloves for their 154-pound bout. Per the NSAC's own regulations, any boxing match contested over 147 mandates 10-ounce gloves, but not this time. Yeah, and, and, and Mayweather, if people that have looked at this at all, Understand most of the time he fought at the weight class that used eight ounce gloves, so he's used to this. Certainly McGregor is used to even smaller at four ounce uh, in MMA. So listen, every little thing, a eh, little thing, they they had to petition for this and they had to sign waivers. So I'm sure the commission was like, oh, sign the waiver. All right, you're you're good. We'll we'll do that. And I I think a lot of people thought it was going to be approved and they were going to be able to use it. And it's just one more footnote in you know who's how many pay per views are, are these guys going to sell. I think everybody wants to believe that this is somehow an advantage for Conor McGregor, but the truth of the matter is, because you point out he fought with four-ounce gloves, you would assume he's going to come into the fight with, like, trying to land the one big knockout punch, can't outbox Floyd. Right, right. So you would think or want to believe or delude yourself into thinking, advantage for Conor, but the truth is these are the gloves Floyd boxes That's with That's exactly all the time. right. And, and they're trying so hard. In the interview Mayweather had with Stephen A. trying to say that Mayweather or, or McGregor should be favored on paper. He's been, You know, it's, it's so transparent. Parent, that is just about getting cells. But I'm in. Yeah, me too. Off the top. The top. Week two of the NFL preseason gets underway Thursday night, including the Jaguars and Bucks at 8 Eastern on ESPN. Both teams are trying to reach the playoffs this season for the first time since 2007. Here are the teams that have had longer NFL playoff droughts than those the Bills mm. since 99, the Browns since 2002, and the Rams since 2004. Yeah, and I don't think any three of those teams are going to break through uh, this year. And then I think of the two teams we're talking about, Tampa Bay and Jacksonville, most would think Tampa Bay has the best shot, though they are in the same division where the last two losing Super Bowl teams, but they got to the Super Bowl, you know, Carolina a couple years ago and Atlanta last year. Uh, But with Jameis Winston, they, they have Evans, Deshaun Jackson, picking up some pieces there. 
So, uh, and I like Jameis, uh, so we'll see where they can go. But uh, I think they're obviously in a better position than Jacksonville right now, which is going to be at some point changing their quarterback and having to, to kind of start over there. Okay, quickly, taking the Bucks out of the equation, mm-hmm. because we all like where they're headed with Jameis, which one of these teams do you think will be the next to break their playoff drought? The well, Bills, Browns, Rams, or Jags? So you're leaving out the Titans, who are also on this list, because I, I would have said that. Am I not reading the Titans? I don't have the Oh, oh that, I have it in, in a sheet here. They, they were – they were eight. They were one back. They were next on the list. Right. So we'll keep them off. Bills, Browns, Rams, Jacksonville. Wow. <sighs> not Jacksonville, not the Rams. I, 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 might gonna, lean, I might lean toward the Bills. That's where I am, too. Yeah. Probably lean toward the Bills. You at least have hope with Tyrod and, and, and not confidently. <laughs> no. It's the division. Yeah. Off the top. And top. finally... Giancarlo Stanton home run streak was snapped last night at six games. His goal, he says now, is 61. He didn't homer against the Giants Wednesday, but said he's shooting for 61 and said he finds baseball statistical history both alluring but also tainted. Stanton is on pace for 61. Babe Ruth hit 60 homers in 1927. Stanton said that achievement has an asterisk because the sport wasn't integrated. Mickey Mantle's teammate Roger Maris broke the record with 61 homers in 1961. Barry Bonds broke that with 73 in 2001 during the steroids there, and Stanton says that's also tainted. He says this specifically. I do think that's tainted, but at the same time, it doesn't matter. The record is the record, but this is why he says he's gunning for 61. Yeah, right, and and, and the record is 73, and, and, and I, I would have the steroid guys in the Hall of Fame, as I think most people are starting to say they would. And what I brought, brought up here was was – it's so easy to pick your spots, integration, PEDs. As I said, there's something in all sports along the way. I brought up the amphetamines earlier that that changed some people's play, you know, that that helped them. Not as obvious as PEDs, uh, but it certainly helped them to, to the point of one tweet that says, steroids by definition are performance enhancing. Greenies could help energize you but not enhance your talent. Dude. Sorry, I disagree. While one, you can point to, why are you taking the amphetamines? You're taking them to be able to play that back-to-back game, that doubleheader. You're taking them so you can be out there. You're taking them for artificial energy to keep you on the field. That maybe normally you wouldn't be or you wouldn't be as active or hyper as you would be where your stats wouldn't be as good. So while it isn't as, yes, I can point to that number, it is was an illegal drug. That helped you increase some stats you had. Bottom line, you may not want to say as dramatic as PEDs, but it still did. And and everyone will just kind of, ah, everybody did it. Oh, okay. Everybody took steroids. Pitchers and hitters in this era. And there was an era where amphetamines were as popular as anything else. So that's all I'm saying. Hard to draw lines. It is. That's off the top. Off the top. Off the top. Mike and Mike is presented by Progressive Insurance, creators of the Name Your Price tool. Choose from a range of coverage options and pick the price that works for you. This was sent in, by the way, under the hashtag Grill Golic. Questions for you this morning mm-hmm. on sports, life, food, whatever it may be. Talking about the fine line of performance-enhancing drugs. Now, I don't know if right. you knew this. I didn't know this. I, and let me amend that. I knew half of this. This is from TS, and we should definitely clarify that I have not seen TS's medical degree. Okay. But – Mike, the big medications in baseball right now are Adderall and Viagra. Adderall for focus. Stay with me. Viagra for oxygen to the muscles. See, that. <laughs> okay. TS's um, medical degree has not been yeah. um, nailed down working well, on well, that, Nimbo. You, you, you definitely hear guys, you know, Adderall is, unless you have a prescription for it, it is on the band. Hey, Adderall's yeah. out there, and uh, Adderall is prevalent. Okay, I, I, I honestly don't know a lot about Adderall. That, that, that is going on now. That was not, at least to my knowledge, going on when I was playing. Uh, uh, the Viagra, I have no idea. I, is that even on the bands? I have no clue about that at all. Uh, I understand from the oxygen to the muscles. I get it. Um, hey, but, is Viagra... But, we got to get himbo on this. Is Viagra? Where is? I, I don't know if I it's don't on, know the, on the list, but the we know list. we know Adderall is unless you have uh, a uh, as I said a, a prescription for it or can prove that it was it was you know doctors uh, prescribed. I, I so I don't know a lot about the drug. 
w- Adderall, what it's used for. Yeah. Adderall increases focus. I mean, focus. I know what it's used it's for. But... speed. It increases focus. Right. Uh, Chris Davis was actually suspended for using Adderall. He has a prescription and an, exem- and an exemption, but at the time of his suspension as a violation, he didn't have that prescription a few years ago. So for, for me, you know, when, when I was playing, again, we did the, the, the mixture of pain pills and shots, I, and I, I've said this before, we tried – or I, I was, was told, hey, some guys are doing this if you want to try it. I believe it was an asthma medicine that we took and, and over, you know, the number of recommended and to help. And it was supposedly to have you catch your second wind quicker or not get not lose your wind and be able to have more energy and play. I mean, this was the stuff you just kind of tried out there. And, and I did try it for a couple of games. And You guys were just a Hunter S. Thompson of football. Well, I, yeah. <laughs> I don't know that. <laughs> hey, those what was your, your what was your first year in the NFL? Eighty five. Eighty five. Eighty five. I'm just trying to figure out yeah. how much of your life was. I'm not saying specifically, but surrounded by essentially North Dallas forty. That whole well, North Dallas of, forty. That was certainly but before, yeah. and, and North Dallas forty to me, and I said this before, is the most realistic football movie on what would go on. Really? Yes, with locker rooms and and shots and pain and not all any that. Not given Sunday. Uh, and. <laughs> Any given Sunday, I walked out of. I, I, you did? I couldn't take it. It, it was. It was to me. It was a joke. You uh, walked out. I thought it was horrific. Yeah. Is that a common practice? Walking out. No, of no, no. I walked out on that and Hope Floats, a Sandra Bullock movie, which I adore her. But for some reason, my wife and I were watching that. We just didn't like it, and we left. I've walked out on one movie. What was it? Beverly Hills Cop Three. Really. Because one and two were so good, I could yeah. not accept that three would be this bad. Yeah, and you had to go. You have to go. I, I, I'm, I'm almost positive. My wife can remind me, as she does on most things, that um, we walked out of any game. It, it, just, it just was ridiculous to me where it was going. But North Dallas 40, yes, I thought was gave a really good portrayal of football. And, you know, when I was in it, it was before they were testing for steroids. There was a lot of guys using steroids, a lot of guys that were using it. And, you know, then testing came in, and it certainly knocked it down when guys would get busted. And, and the same we, we have seen in baseball as well. As I said, in every sport, there's something along the way that you can point to to different things. Viagra, I think Himbo just got on this, is not banned in MLB, according to an article written in 2012. But, FYI, little, uh, little public service announcement, extends is banned. <clears throat> Extends? Yeah. E-X-T-N. E-X-T-E-N-Z-E. So I just don't. That's for any How baseball players listening. <laughs> Hopefully no more than five hours. 30 seconds? I mean, what? This is another good note, since you didn't know. Yeah. Extends. I'm just going to read this the way it's written. A male enhancement su- supplement endorsed by Jimmy Johnson. Oh, well, check cashed. <laughs> Let's get a list of endorsements that Golick is open to. <laughs> ex, ex, so Viagra not on the list. Extends is. Correct. Okay. So everyone wonder, write this down so we get it straight. I wonder what the ingredient is <laughs> that makes this one. Oh, he's been taking extends. <laughs> All right. Do we want, what do we want to and it's the off season. What the hell's going on? How would you know? I, <laughs> <clears throat> All right, let's move on. To We're Phil. going down the road here, aren't we? <laughs> no, no, we are, we are, we are safely between the lines. This okay. thing's not in the ditch. All right. Mike and Mike is presented by Progressive Insurance. Let's do a little game of fill in the blank. All Shall right, Himbo. Mm-hmm. Who reads this? You read this. I read this. Come on, man. I'm, I, think, I got it. Uh, I got. It. Way to go, Hembo. Way to jump in and help out. Yeah. Appreciate the oh, nonverbal doesn't have communication. Them. Yeah, that would make it difficult, wouldn't it? <laughs> the Nevada Athletic Commission making a one-time exception to allow uh, Mayweather McGregor to fight with eight-ounce gloves is just fine. I mean, I, you know, Mayweather has has boxed with these gloves most of his career, and and they weren't going to be less than that. They weren't going to use the MMA four-ounce gloves, so you know that wasn't going to happen. So, I find nothing wrong with this at all. I I, I was. I didn't know enough about, about boxing to know the delineation of when they went to 10 outs, and I understand why they go to the bigger gloves when you get the, the bigger, heavier guys, but this, this one doesn't surprise me one bit. My word is interesting. In it, what way? It is because, you know, I just I gave you my whole spiel about everyone wants to believe, and that everyone is going to encompass me, 
that this somehow gives Conor McGregor some slight edge that he didn't have before, that he wouldn't have with 10-ounce gloves. Mm -hmm. I know very well that Mayweather has boxed with 8-ounce gloves for the majority of his career. But if Mayweather is to win, if there is a hope, if there is a 1% chance or a .05% chance, it's got to come by the knockout, which means smaller gloves help that cause. Everything in this fight is interesting. I'm not going to sit here and pass judgment on whether or not it should or shouldn't be. It just is. It is. I it's agree. Interesting. I agree. Uh, completely agree. And we're all going to buy it. And we're all going to sit there and possibly be disappointed by what a one-sided fight it's going to be. But we all will sit there with hope that there'll be that one punch landed and then, then that we may get a fight. Hey, I once had this meeting. Uh, it just sounds so, so – this image is awful. In L.A. with this TV guy mm-hmm. in L.A. And he told me, if anybody ever tells you your idea, your pitch, it's interesting, right. it means it's not. The word interesting, interesting is, is the biggest a, generic yeah. cop out word there is. Kind of like, like mm, that's interesting. Kind of like, but they have a good personality. <laughs> yeah, right. yeah. Okay. All right. The Raiders being the most bet on team to win the Super Bowl is blank. Wow. Um, I guess I, with Raider fans out there, I would, I, I would say not surprising. There's, a, I mean, Raider Nation is ridiculous. You know how how big it is, and. You know, you, you take a little bit of a chance there because you know the Patriots are the favorite. So, you know, you, you like to win a little bit of money. So if you're going to take that chance and go outside New England, Oakland would be the place I would go. I, I think it's New England at the top, and then I think it's Oakland and, and the Steelers that are the two teams. that. And you know we're always going to get that surprise team or two. You know that's going to happen. But if I were a betting man and I didn't want to take the favorite, I, I, would, take, I would take the Raiders as well. I think my word's going to be interesting. The Raiders being the most bet you know on the Super Bowl is interesting. interesting. No, what? Yeah, so you... <laughs> no, my, 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 uh, my word is actually like cash money. I mean, here's why. Listen, the Raiders are on a list of teams, I believe, that are undervalued based specifically on their performance on the field. There is, a, there is a market out there ready and willing to do anything with their money for one of these teams. Buy gear, bet right. on. I would put in this category the Raiders, the New York Knicks. If I'm a guy with a billion dollars, these are the teams I want to buy. Because, right. you know, you put a little inner effort into what the product is on the field and the value explodes. Now, the Raiders are, and they're on the way up. Right. But this is evidence to me. You put a good product on the field and your brand explodes. A few of these, Knicks, Raiders. I don't know who else, but that's what this is for me. There you go. All right. I, I can go with that. The Mets making 22 defensive changes to hide their catching. Playing the field that, is. Their, is that their catcher and not the catching? I don't know what that is. It's their catcher. It was written wrong. To hide their catcher playing the field is. I'm going to defer to Hembo. Hembo, what do you think of this one? Uh, what word would you use? Well, I think it's pretty sad that they can't find a, a non-catcher to start at third base, don't you? Right. I would say so, yeah. Okay. 22 Defensive changes, that's a lot, wouldn't you say? It's a lot. Yeah. This, to, to, they can't find a non-catcher to yeah. play third base? Yeah. I look at the other way. This is deep. They are deep at the catcher. Okay, that's one way. <laughs> You're a glass half full guy. Nick Saban ranting about the preseason predictions is? Nick Saban. I mean, that, that's Nick. I mean, would you expect anything less from him? You know, the one thing, he, he does get agitated with you, and he'll let you know. We'll play his, the sound from him in a little bit, being in midseason form already. But he, he will – you light the fuse on him, and then you just kind of step back and wait for it to go off. we got to play this sound. Yeah, we will. It is, it yep. is not only intense, it's comical in the end. But the truth of the matter is this, Golik, um, I really <laughs> like Saban. I think guys like Saban too. and Belichick have cracked the code to success by focusing on process – and daily practice goals as opposed to overarching life or Super Bowl or college championship goals. But I don't like this. It's, it's too easy to get on the media always, oh, always, I know. always. Oh, listen, I'm completely Nick, with you. What, I, that they made predictions? Yeah, yeah. I, I'm Come completely on, with you. You turn it around and you point the finger there. That, that is an easy way out. But, again, he's done it before, so it's not shocking to me. Jim Mora expecting Josh Rosen to be back next season is blank. Is what else is he going to say? I mean, I, 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 we've, we've already heard reports that Sam Darnold was going to be coming back. These are two guys that could be very high in the draft, one of them being number one. And, and now we're hearing reports that both may come back. And you know what I say to that is I guess my, my word is a phrase. I'll believe it when I see it. Because, God forbid, the person has a good year and they're going to be near the top, the temptation to come out is going to be real and strong. And I know top guys have gone back. We've certainly seen it before. 
but I'll believe it when I see it. Yeah, my word is going to be delusional. There's no way Josh Rosen is coming back. <laughs> if he does, I change my word to revealing. Hey, yeah, Josh, quarter, uh, college football is so bad. Yeah. Such a tough existence. You're going to come back. Yeah. Yeah, that makes sense. <laughs> the Falcons putting a Chick-fil-A in their new stadium, even though it won't be open on Sunday, is blank. Consistent. They're not open on Sundays, and they're not, they're not going to be open on Sunday. So I give them credit. They didn't get into a, a, a verbal war with anybody publicly to look for public opinion. That's how they run their business, and they're going to continue running their business that way. So consistent. Take notes, NFL. Principled. This is how we roll, says Chick-fil-A. This is what we do. And Falcons, you want our business? This is how our business comes. We don't do business on Sunday. It's going to be really interesting, though, on home games on Sunday. Hey, everyone, Mike Golick here. Support for the Mike and Mike podcast comes from our friends at Rocket Mortgage by Quicken Loans. Chances are you're confident when it comes to your work, your hobbies, your life. Rocket Mortgage gives you that same level of confidence when it comes to buying a home or refinancing your existing home loan. Rocket Mortgage is simple, allowing you to fully understand all the details and be confident you're getting the right mortgage for you. To get started, go to rocketmortgage.com slash mics. Equal housing lender, licensed in all 50 states, NMLS, consumeraccess.org number 3030. Excited to have on the Shale Pinzo performance line, NBC Sports NFL analyst, Tony Dungy. Good morning, Coach. Hey, good morning, Will and Mike. How are you guys? Doing well, Tony. Thanks for uh, joining us this morning. And, and let's start, you know, with, with the, the Zeke Elliott situation. The league is, has, has done their suspension and – you know, now they're going to appeal. And we'll see where all that goes. All head coaches are different. So back with your head coaching cap back on of how, you know, some will just say, hey, the league will deal with it. And, and, and whatever they say goes, when we get them back, we get them back. And then there are coaches that will, will have that vested interest, interest in Zeke Elliott, the person, in talking with him. How would you handle that? And if you were talking to him through all of this, what would be your words to him? Well, I think I'd have a couple of messages. Number one, we're in your corner. You're you're on our team. You're one of our guys, and we're going to stand behind you. Uh, we'll try to get this figured out. We'll go to the league and, and do everything we can to help. But number two, you've got to take some ownership of this, Zeke, and you've got to not put yourself in position to have this happen, number one, for you and your teammates. So let's see how we can move forward and kind of eliminate some of these these things that uh, have been causing problems. And I I think the Cowboys have to do that. It's one thing to say, hey, we're going to go to the league and we don't think much happened. All of that could be true. But uh, I think the message to Ezekiel Elliott is you can't continue to put yourself in position where these kind of things come up. Tony, how would you, beyond words, beyond, um, and I don't mean this as any kind of a, a diminishing term beyond a sermon for the player how would you do something specifically to help him get on the straight and narrow we know that the cowboys for example with des bryant have assigned a mentor to him um i think that similar tact was tried with less success with pac-man jones how would you or did you ever for that matter do something like that with one of your players beyond just talking to him Oh, absolutely. You you always do that. You point them to the guys who have had success doing things the right way. And, and the Cowboys have plenty. They've got, you know, Calvin Hill um, is in their front office. And, you know, he's there specifically for that to be a mentor and, and give those guys some help. Then you have you said point to guys like Jason Witten and say, look, he, here's a guy you need to follow, you need to talk to. And I'm sure Jason has done that, but – uh, Ezekiel has got to be the guy that says, okay, let me let me kind of figure this out and, and put myself around the guys who have been successful. And, um, you know, it takes some time sometimes. And these are young guys, and we can't forget that, but um, he's got to make the decision. Ezekiel does. I'm a, a professional football player now, and things are, are a little different. It's different than being a high school player or a college player. Uh, I've got to, to get myself going and be in a position where I can help my teammates and not be a distraction. Completely agree. I, I mean, you can, as they say, you can get drafted in the NFL, but that doesn't make you a professional. And you could show them all the people that you want that are great examples, but they have to want to learn from that as well. I agree with you. We're talking yeah. to Tony Dungy, Pro Football Hall of Famer. Another issue that's come up that's, that's not only football, but a social issue is 
the kneeling and sitting for the national anthem. And we saw, you know, with Bennett and with Lynch doing it as, as of late in the first preseason games. We heard guys like Hugh Jackson, the coach of the Browns, come out and say that he would hope his guy doesn't want his guys uh, to be doing that. So I, I know for some it's a touchy subject, and it's like walking on eggshells. For others, they're very clear in their thoughts of, hey, you have a right to do it, or, man, I really would rather these people not do it. How would you handle this situation uh, if you had a player or if it was going on and nobody on your team had knelt or somebody did? Would you talk to that person or would you make this a team meeting type of thing? Well, I think you have a team meeting uh, probably last year when it all started coming to light and you talk to the guys and here's what I would do, Mike, and have done it in situations like this. Um, hey, here's what's going on. I appreciate you guys' feelings. Um, Let's do this. Think about what you want to do, how you want to attack this, and think about how you can make the situation better. If you really believe that kneeling for the national anthem on game day will bring some attention to this, will illuminate your point, will help make the situation better, then I'm behind you. We're all for it. We'll stand behind you. But don't just do it because other people are doing it. Don't just do it because you think it's going to make a statement. If you feel like it's going to help, then I'm behind you. Let's think about it, and then let's, let's move forward. And let people discuss it. And why do you think it's going to help? What are you trying to do? And generally when guys discuss that, then not only do they clarify their thoughts, but then their teammates can say, okay, here's why Michael Bennett is doing it. I might not agree with that, but I understand his reasoning, and as a teammate I'm going to stand behind him. And, and encourage that kind of dialogue. Coach, I can think of no one better to ask this of, but I've been fascinated, and we've had this conversation, uh, me with, with Green and Gullick yesterday as a guest, but this the idea of when do you know with a quarterback if you've got something? I imagine you know pretty quickly as somebody like Peyton Manning joins your team. Yeah, I, I'm, not, I'm talking about his rookie year. Yeah, we, he's got it. He's got it, clearly. Yeah. But what I'm more fascinated by is when do you know when a guy doesn't have it? How quickly, for example, could the Rams know after drafting Jared Goff, wow, we made a massive mistake here? I'm not saying that they did, and I'm not saying they think they did, but I'm just curious how quickly can you know huge mistake? You you don't always know that right away. And and what happens is you get enough situations where – um, the guy should come through. You, uh, difficult situations when those great ones come through and you just don't see the progress. But but you're right. You know right away. I, I played with Joe Montana as a rookie. And even though he only played about, I'd say, 100 plays his rookie year, but just watching him in practice, the way he carried himself on the bus, in the meetings, you, said, you know, there, there's something about this guy. I met Drew Brees when he was a senior at Purdue in an elevator in Tampa at the Outback Bowl. And talking to him for two minutes, I said, gosh, this is a guy I'd love to have on, on my team. They, they just, the way they carry themselves, the, the way they handle situations, you know they've got it. People can develop that, but there will be times you say, hey, we, we put them in these situations in practice, I put them in these situations in the game, and gosh, it just didn't happen. Uh, but I think that takes time. Someone like Jared Goff, I don't think you you know in one game or one season, um, hey, he had these three opportunities, and I was disappointed, so he doesn't have it. People can certainly grow into that. Coach, how often are you fooled, though? That elevator pitch, that elevator moment with Drew Brees, or the way Joe Montana carries himself on the, on the team bus, how often have you been fooled by that? Because I imagine that can't be science, right? I mean, that that, that – there's got to be a lot of it, it, yeah. It's it not a confident guy. I will say this: in my experience, um, I have been fooled less by guys who I, I thought had it and didn't. But but you're waiting for that guy. You think he might have it. You hope he has it. You, you put all your eggs in the basket, and they don't come through. Uh, but usually, a guy like Peyton Manning, Drew Brees, Joe Montana, you see it and you say, "Wow!" And you're usually right. It is. Uh, you know, very seldom does does a guy come up. Andrew Luck, um, just uh, again, I saw him the first day of practice. Jim Harsey invited me out to their first training camp practice. You saw the way he organized the team, the way he ran it, the, the admiration even the veterans had for him in the first 15 minutes of, of that practice. Say, hey, this guy's going to be something special. 
So the first preseason games just went on. You had rookie quarterbacks, Deshaun Watson, Mitchell Trubisky, Deshaun Kaiser, uh, that played well. Mahomes did as well, but with Alex Smith there, I don't think there's any thought process of, of, of unseating him. So those other three guys, they're playing well in their first preseason game, and social media, the board, the Twitter world is lighting up. <laughs> oh, my God, they're going to be starting. The, 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 the clock's going to start sooner, and everybody's loving it. So now – Take us with the head coaching cap again to the day after that first preseason game. Now you're in the meeting room with those quarterbacks. What's the conversation and what's going on that would maybe make make fans realize they have to pull the reins a little bit? Well, you, you are. You're watching everything, and you're not just watching the highlight throws. You're watching what did he get us in the right play uh, or out of a bad play. Uh, did he do the things that we talked about in the meeting room? Did he see the things that we pointed out about the defense, those little things that are going to determine uh, how well you do in the course of the season? This first preseason game, nobody game plans. Nobody knows a, a lot about you. Nobody knows the plays you're going to run. Uh, Mitchell Trubisky was outstanding, okay? And I, I watched all the throws on, on the YouTube reel or whatever. Tremendous. But now – Everybody else is going to watch that, too, and we're going to see, okay, but hey, these boots and these out-of-the-pocket things, I've got to do something. Uh, there, there'll be a lot more defenses that he has to see. So you can't really judge off one game, but uh, I think the message from all these head coaches will give is let's slow the train down. Yes, we think he's going to be exceptional, but there's still a lot of work to do. The best of Mike and Mike. It's Mike and Mike on ESPN Radio and ESPN2. Will Kane filling in for Greeny today along with Golick. The show is presented by Progressive Insurance and all guests on the Shell Pinzo Performance Line, which in a matter of minutes will include First Take's own Stephen A. Smith. You just had a long day with him yesterday, didn't you? Every day's long with Stephen. <laughs> <laughs> I want to do a little house cleaning here because okay. we've had some conversations this morning that need some tidying up. Okay. Uh, we did get a tweet earlier, first mm -hmm. of all. Based on a conversation you started the day with, where do you draw the line on performance-enhancing drugs? If right. you're going to throw out Barry Bonds' record for HGH, possibly, do you throw out 1970s records for greenies? Mm -hmm. Where do you find the line in these kind of things? And we had a tweet from someone I am, you know, 100% sure is a doctor, right? <laughs> saying that they just what play one on Twitter. <laughs> what you don't realize is Adderall is mm -hmm. a very, very common performance-enhancing drug used in sports and Viagra. And the argument, according to our Twitter doctor, which you should most definitely trust, mm -hmm. was that Viagra helps blood to the muscles, thus enhancing oxygen there. Yeah, exactly. F sports. I guess we understand <laughs> the thought process of what it's used for, but I didn't know for overall. I, I, right. I, I knew specifically, I didn't know generally that that general happened. muscles, general oxygen to the muscles. Yeah. And <laughs> Adderall, I have to admit th that that wasn't. I, I'm not going to say it wasn't around when I was playing. That wasn't a thing yeah. that because I you hear about students taking it around test time so they can stay awake. It's like a, like a basically a form of speed, correct? Yeah, it's a PED basically. for life apparently. Uh, and, and it is on the banned list unless you know you have a uh, you know a doctor's note, a prescription for it. But I did not know that about Viagra. Well, and Himbo has told us through research that Viagra is not on the banned list for Major League Baseball. However, mm -hmm. extends extends. Yeah, endorsed by Jimmy Johnson. Mm -hmm is on the ban list for Major League Baseball. And now I've got a few tweets on it. This from oh, Rasta Don. He said, what, you're nervous? No. Uh, They're no. doctors, I'm sure. I'm sure they are. Rasta Don, see, yeah, right sure. there. Doctor. Sounds, sounds like a doctor to me. Right. <laughs> Says, Viagra is used a lot with professional bodybuilders to help blood flow. <clears throat> I'll keep going. Okay. Gabe Herrera, Viagra is banned in cycling. We should check on that, Himbo. Really? Yeah. Let's find out. Speaking of Himbo and his excellent research it's abilities. It's comfortable be to sit on the button. Never mind. What? <clears throat> nothing. I couldn't hear you. I, yeah, it's nothing. You, can you repeat yeah, yourself? Yeah, I'm comfortable to sit on the button. Okay, <laughs> yes. Don't know. Viagra's banned in cycling for injury reasons. Ah, well, uh, yeah, exactly. That's exactly my point. <laughs> Himbo, uh, um, <laughs> who deserves a round of applause this morning. For a variety of reasons. But I put it out there after watching Hard Knocks. This is great. I yeah. love this. After watching Hard Knocks, I noticed that Jameis Winston's accent resembles Charles Barkley's. I started wondering how many professional athletes are from that area. And Bessemer, Alabama has a big population of NFL players from Bo Jackson to now to D'Amico Ryans and as well 
uh, Jameis Winston. But I asked, which cities have the most NFL players per capita? And this research study conducted by Area Vibes says, here are your top uh, NFL players per capita produced by city of, cities of 10,000 residents or more. Youngstown, Ohio, number one. Ten NFL players per 10,000 residents. Canton, Ohio, perhaps appropriately. Yeah, how about it? Number two at seven and a half. Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, three at six and a half. Birmingham, Alabama, number four. Miami, Florida, number five. You know what's amazing here? You go down to the top ten. It's Pensacola, St. Louis, New Orleans, Cincinnati, and Cleveland. So four of the top ten are in Ohio. Four of the top ten. Youngstown, number one. Canton, number two. Cincinnati, number nine. And Cleveland, number 10. Again, these numbers are measured by players per 10,000 residents. You know what? I'm thinking this is skewed by, can we get this, like, post-1970 NFL? How is, I hear your Ohio pride, and I'm just oh, wondering all of, where all of Texas a sudden, is on this. Skewed. Huh? All of a sudden it's skewed because you don't like the results? Let's just see if it changes. How many Texas cities were on there? Let, let's, hey, okay. Oh, none. Himbo. Oh, that's right, none. There were none. No Texas, no Florida, no California. Oh, there was Florida. There was yes. Miami and there was Pensacola. Okay, well, forget I said Florida. that part. Forget that part. Yeah. No Texas, no California. You're suspect. Oh, you're suspect. Well, listen, all of a sudden you're right to the conspiracy theory because, okay. God forbid, my home state has four of the top ten in it. All right, get on it, Himbo. Let me make that harder for you. Jeez. I've been told three times in my ear that Stephen A. Smith is on the line, which means he's starting to get upset. Why aren't you talking <laughs> to me? <laughs> Stephen A. Smith of First Take on the Shell Pins Oil Performance Line. Good morning, Stephen A. Well, first – First of all, a couple of things. Golick, kudos to you. Congratulations. I don't know how you sit next to that man for four hours. That's number one. Thank you. Number two, I, you know I'm sitting here waiting, you know, coming on as a guest. And typical Will Kane, true to form, keeps talking and talking and talking, knowing I'm waiting. This is the kind of disrespect that I have to deal with. And just What's so up, you, Will? Just how are so, you? Stephen, Good just so you know, while he was talking, I was looking at him mouthing, Stephen A is on the line, get to Stephen A, and he would shake yep. his head he no, like I don't need to do <laughs> and it. And he took his time. And he, and he, and he took his time. That, 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 that sounds like Will. That sounds like Will. <laughs> All but right, well, thanks buddy. for joining us this morning, Stephen A. We'll be talking to you later. Yeah. <laughs> That's Stephen A. Smith on the Shell Pins All Performance right. Line. <laughs> hey, Stephen A., let, let, let's start with – the the news coming out. I don't. I don't. I don't. It's not like earth shattering or anything like that. But in your mind, in the in the boxing world and the boxing game, what it means that the fight was approved for eight ounce gloves. Well, to me, I I look at it as work at, at something that's to the uh, not not to end it to the advantage of Conor McGregor literally because I don't expect him to touch Floyd. I expect Floyd to pretty much school and annihilate him. And Floyd obviously is accustomed to fighting with eight ounce gloves. Uh, but the flip side to it is that if you are a puncher and you're looking for a puncher's chance, which is the only chance Conor McGregor has, the fact that the uh, eight 10-ounce gloves were reduced to eight, um, I think is something that helps him in that case, in, in that cause. I don't think it will ultimately end up helping him, but I do think that it improves his chances. It improves the chances of a puncher to have smaller ounce gloves. I think that's the only thing you can say about this. Stephen A., it's 9 a.m. I know that you already know to some extent what you guys are going to be debating on first take today. I'm not on the show, so I'm very curious where you are on this. I have a strong opinion about the statement put out by the NFL yesterday in opposition to the NFLPA questioning Ezekiel Elliott's former girlfriend, alleged victim, and her credibility. The NFL has stated that any questions about her credibility or at least the way that the NFLPA is rolling that out is victim shaming. What do you think about that? Well, I have a, I have a problem with it strictly because Ezekiel Elliott, if he if he believes he is innocent, has a right to fight, and the NFLPA as a union has a right to defend their guy. That's their job. Literally, it's their job. But the other side to this is that I didn't know that the NFL was in the guilt or innocence business. I do understand that they're concerned about the integrity of the shield and protecting that at all costs, and I do get that part. But what this shows me is that the NFL obviously was inclined to do everything it could. They did. I'm not going to accuse them of not putting forth their due diligence, but as you know, uh, Will, 
I've been on the record saying that while I had no problem whatsoever with the six-game suspension, I did have a problem, Golik, so you know how long it took for them to come to that conclusion. Because even though we are living in different times because of Ray Rice and what transpired with him and Greg Hardy and Ray McDonald, et cetera, et cetera, I still harken back to 2010 when I saw a National Football League that basically dealt with Big Ben Roethlisberger in a way that said, okay, we don't know about his guilt or innocence, but he should not have put himself in that position. It stains the league. We're going to deal with him. Whereas in the case of Ezekiel Elliott, Elliott, they seem to be going out of their way to say, we believe he's guilty. And I don't think of any sports league belongs in that business. Okay, follow me. Fo- the NFL. Follow me here on this, and you can both answer. But, Stephen A., let me start with you. Instead of guilty or innocence, I'm looking at this more as a civil suit where they only have to okay. prove 51%, and instead of guilt or innocence, it's you're culpable. If, if that, in fact, is more along the lines of where this is, would you buy more into that? Well, see, I, I don't have a problem with it, Golik. If you're talking about Ezekiel Elliott and the alleged victim, I'm saying as it pertains to the NFL, who is supposed to be somewhat of a neutral party, particularly as it pertains to trying to gather evidence or what have you, you are the National Football League. You are not the court of law. Yeah, you have your own laws. You have your own standards. And if the man didn't meet standards because he stained the shield, all I'm saying is that's enough to justify the six-game suspension. You don't have to add stuff like you're, you're touching on a preponderance of evidence and saying it's more likely that he's guilty than he is not. There's no problem with that as it pertains to deflated football because we're talking about football. But when you're talking about off-the-field matters, personal matters, domestic matters and what have you, I don't believe that any sports league should be in the guilt or innocence business because so much money is involved, Golick. Who's to say that a case, and I'm not accusing the NFL of anything like this, but I'm just being devil's advocate here. Who's to say a sports league, knowing that there's an abundance of money at stake and what have you, depending on the situation, depending on the case, wouldn't be influenced by that to determine one's guilt or innocence. We don't know that. That's why we have a court of law. The sports leagues themselves should be sticking to the issue of whether or not you stain the league and compromise their brand. They shouldn't go any further than that when it comes to trying to discern one's innocence or guilt because there's too many agendas that are involved in the equation that can convolute matters. And I don't trust the sports league to play that role. I hear you. So what I hear you saying, Stephen A., if I'm understanding correctly, is actually, NFL, your burden of proof doesn't need to be more likely than not. Your burden of proof doesn't need to be anything, but you decided this because you feel like the whole thing tarnishes your image. You're going the other way. You're right. lowering the burden of proof. Whereas I yesterday said to you, Mike Golick, that I think they ought to mimic the criminal justice system. Guilty there, guilty here. Innocent there, innocent here. Stephen well, A's going the other way. He's saying you don't need any burden of proof. You know why? Because it's your business. But here's the thing I disagree with you on, Stephen A. They're not trying to find guilt or innocence. They're not fi- trying to find truth. If the NFL's position were this to me and to you and to you, Golick, if it were – you know what? We've examined this entire thing. There are some credibility problems with uh, the alleged victim here. But even considering those, mm-hmm. when we come out the other end, we decide this is worth a punishment. If, they, if that was the line they were holding to, I think that's acceptable. But what they did starting yesterday is suggesting any questions about her credibility, which there are many questions now, including lying to police in a possible, according to Yahoo Sports, extortion plan against Izzy Elliott. If you engage in any of that, you're engaging in victim shaming, which says to me well, they're not searching for the truth, Stephen A. They're searching to win a PR battle. Well, you, you, well, well, you, you put it succinctly. I get where you're coming from in terms of they're searching to win a PR battle. But in order to win the PR battle, what they're saying is truth lies on our side. And what I'm saying to you is that forget all that. If you're the National Football League, you're a multi-billion dollar establishment. You play in our league. Do not find yourself in this situation. Growing up in the streets of New York City, I found myself in one situation after another when I was younger. And my mom, God rest her soul, would always come to me no matter what the situation is. It could be a speeding ticket. It could be a a parking ticket. It could be me getting in a fight. It could be anything. My mother would always say to me, Will Golick, why you? 
Why are you the one in this situation? Of all the people in the world that this stuff is going on with, the cop stopped you for a speeding ticket, the cop gave you a parking ticket, this fight that took place, you, oh, it happened to be you by accident? Why you? And what I'm saying is, to me, any multi-billion dollar establishment that relies upon more than a thousand players to represent and uphold their brand, their shield, has a right to hold you accountable if you stain the shield. And I'm saying all of this other stuff ain't needed by the NFL. Deke Lelly, you've been accused of this stuff. This is what the police report said. These are what, or this is what our investigation pointed out. July 17th, July 19th, July 21st, domestic violence incidences. Now, you can sit up there and explain it till the cows come home. That's for law enforcement officials so you don't end up finding your behind in jail. But during these day and times, with what we're going through in this world, for you to allow yourself to be put in this position, damn it, you're going to pay. Six games, done. And they don't have to justify it beyond that, in my opinion, because they're not talking about innocence or guilt. They're talking about the responsibility that you have to protect the brand you swore to protect after you was drafted and you signed that contract to be an NFL player, period. Stephen, let me ask you a, a larger question. Coming off of, of how we see the relationship with Adam Silver and Michelle Roberts in, in the NBA and the Players Association, how they seem to be getting along well. It certainly seems that way and things they're agreeing upon and such. In the NFL, we know the adversity but with, with the union and the players, with Demora Smith and with Roger Goodell. If, in fact, we do say this relationship will get better over time, if that does happen, what in your mind will have to happen between these two entities for there to be a better relationship? You're talking about the play, the NFL Players Association and, and the, the NFL? The, the union and the league. What, the, it's a horrible, oh, that's a easy, horrible relationship. That's, a, that's, an easy, that's an easy question. I hold two people solely accountable for it. Roger Goodell and Demoris Smith. Because let me tell you something right now. These two can't stand each other. They can smile in your face. They can talk about business, but it's well documented. Talk to anybody who covers the NFL, and they don't get along. Now, to some degree, I hold DeMora Smith even more culpable than Roger Goodell. Here's why. Roger Goodell has the power bestowed upon him by 32 billionaires who, who are, are, are league owners in the National Football League. What has happened is that DeMora Smith comes up in there very astute, very intelligent, very accomplished as a lawyer in a legal mind. What does he want to do? Everything appears to be a legal issue. There is a difference between labor negotiations and labor relations, and everyone that I have spoken to in the NFL on both sides decry the fact that DeMora Smith does not do a good enough job with labor relations because he loves battling against Roger Goodell, and the NFL proclaims repeatedly that he tries to turn everything into a legal issue. And so when you have that going on, if you're Roger Goodell, what are you going to do when somebody tries to challenge or, dare I say, usurp your power? You're going to raise up, you're going to fight, and you're going to remind them who's the big fish in this pond. That's what Roger Goodell, through the, uh, you know, uh, in, in, in support by the, uh, by the league owners, that is exactly what he does. And if you're DeMaurice Smith, you turn stuff into a legal issue, it explains why, you know, the NFLPA always has a bunch of lawyers on retainer, whether they're employed by the Players Association or they're being retained. The fact of the matter is Gene Upshaw, and he, Lord knows he wasn't perfect, God rest his soul, but and a lot of players complained about him as well. But you listen to folks that talk about Tagliabue and him and others, and they talk about labor relations, going out, having a drink, having a dinner, talking things out, finding a way to finagle your way through things. That's not what DeMora Smith and Roger Goodell does. Every time we hear about something with these two, there are lawyers right next door ready to go to war. And that is the problem with these two guys. They got to they gotta, they gotta grow up when it comes to each other, not in any other capacity because I'm not qualified. But when it comes to themselves as individuals and their personal relationship, both of them got to grow up. DeMore, Smith, DeMore Smith's term ends next March um, of 2018. He's been elected on a three-year term. His first term started in March of 2009, so we'll see if the NFLPA feels differently about their executive director next spring. You know, I've been thinking, sitting here thinking about your standards, Stephen A., and the truth of the matter is we're, we're polar opposites, no surprise. 
Um, but yours makes a lot of sense. And the truth of the matter is, I think you can go either way. If you have a standard that says we follow the criminal justice system, that's fine. If you have a standard that you lay out, Stephen A., we don't need to explain ourselves. We just do this. That's fine as well. I think what the NFL needs to learn, and I don't mean to make light of this, but they need to learn from Chick-fil-A. We talked about this this morning. This is our business. We don't open on Sundays. Doesn't matter if we're inside Atlanta's football stadium. We don't do this. If you have a standard and you live up to it, and go look, you and I talked about this a while back when I was sitting in the guest chair about kids and, and raising children and setting bright line rules for kids. That's the way you influence behavior. You set standards, and that's what the NFL needs to do. And I guess I'm sitting here today well, mad that they're calling credibility questions, which are pertinent, victim shaming. Just set a standard, and I think you're right, Stephen A., either you go my way or you go yours. You don't have to sit here and explain it. Right. That's true, I, but I will tell you that the Chick-fil-A is a bad example because I do require that you make some, some, some degree of sense. If you're Chick-fil-A and you don't open, you don't do business on Sundays, that makes total sense, except if you're in a football stadium. No Seven concerts. of Atlanta's eight games. And I'm just, okay, that's concerts. Yeah, that's fair, but I guess College what I'm football. saying is this. Primarily, primarily. Your business is, 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 you know, you want to be there primarily because you want to be associated with the NFL. If most of their games are played on Sundays, what are you doing having a business right in there? Well, Chick-fil-A that's doesn't care what thing. you think, and that's the point. They don't care. That's their standard. I, I, that's, I, guess, I guess that's Will's point, yeah. 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 <laughs> and before we go, uh, you got like a minute. I want to just make Golik mad quickly. Um, is LeBron leaving Cleveland? I, I am. Oh, no, I'm asking what Steve. I'm, oh, God. <laughs> well, from what I'm told, this is last year. I mean, who knows what LeBron, he does what he wants to do, and he's earned the right to do it. But I will tell you that everyone in NBA circles, including myself and Wojnarowski, I mean, we all believe that, you know, in, in all likelihood he's probably gone, but we don't rule out the possibility that he's going to stay. If, if LeBron James can still legitimately compete for championships and make, you know, uh, goobs and gobs of money, uh, then he, he, he may stay in Cleveland. I doubt it. But anything's possible with him. He's earned the right to do what he wants, and he's not going to make a decision until he absolutely has to. That's just how he rolls. All right.